Testing one, two, three. Testing one, two, three. Hey there, Brave Hearts, Urbanites, and Coach Mad Hatters. And welcome to my uh, Saturday morning. It's Saturn's Day, <laughs> June 13th, 2020. Um, <laughs> right at the beginning, I pause. Isn't that something? Sometimes that's a good thing. Sometimes it's not. Right now, I think that it is. Um, it's beautiful. The sun is shining. The birds are singing. The air, the, the summer breeze makes me feel fine. Yeah. It is blowing <laughs> through all of the transgressions in my mind. <laughs> I got up this morning and I knew, I knew that the only way that this energy that was permeating my presence was going to begin to flow with some sense and sincerity to it was if I got in the space to speak to you. Was not in the plan. It was not in the rundown. So today, um, as the series, the newsroom say, we're going to throw out the rundown and we're just going to freestyle it. And freestyling it in, in terms of this was not in the plan today, but because I feel it, I'm going to lean into it and I'm going to give the energy what it wants. And I think it wants to speak to you through me. And I'm going to hold tight with that. Um, guided by the supporting evidence of how in just the last 45 minutes, an entire lecture just came to be. So. I'm noticing a pattern. I'm noticing that I will have the urge to shuffle cards and an entire spread will come out and I will end up sitting on that spread for days. And, and when I say sitting on it, I mean like I'll lay it out and ponder it, take notes and before I am able to come to a firm conclusion of what it's saying to me, I'm into the next day. Lay them out again, focus on them, meditate on them, refer to the guidebooks, take notes. So um, the spread that is before me came out in a How can I say it, 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 it laid itself out in a way I've never seen before. And even by late afternoon yesterday, I was in contemplation. Now, am I to read these cards clockwise or counterclockwise? So it came across that I will be reading them clockwise with the core center as the eye and the core center in the eye is justice. So we're going to travel clockwise around this spread. And the theme or the thematic series of this session, this moment that we are sharing is going to be considered the tipping of the hourglass. And what came to mind with regards to that is the Harry Potter series in book six, when Harry and, uh, and I can see his, 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 his face, but I can't remember his name right now. Um, they were, uh, when, when Harry was trying to provoke the professor for information about um, Tom Riddle and the hourglass that was sitting, it was right after, <laughs> incredible, okay. So I know this moment might be a little weird for those that are not familiar with the, uh, the, the Potterverse uh, <laughs> culture and <laughs> not, they don't speak, <laughs> they don't speak in Harry Potter terms. But, um, so just flow with me. It, it, it'll make sense. It'll definitely make sense by the time we're done. Um, but in, in the scene, 
when uh, the professor speaks, the sand inside the hourglass slows down. And so the professor tells Harry, like when you are in the midst of a conversation that actually matters, when you're in the midst of communication or true authentic expression or the exchange of something that honestly matters to you, that unlocks something for you, that brings clarity for you, or for both, or for those involved, let's say that. So when, 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 when one or many, whether they're talking to self or other, are, when, when, when we are engaged in conversation, it honestly makes a difference. Time slows down almost to a complete stop. And when paradigm shift, it is the figurative term of the tipping of the hourglass. That means that every, slates are clean, things are rectified or reconciled, and now we can begin again. It made so much sense to me because of the way that the cards are situated. And before the audio of this moment began, you were able to view the situation of the cards. I will also post it at the end where you'll have the opportunity to pause and take note, especially if you find yourself wanting to situate tarot as your primary love language. So tarot is a first language, which is something I coined a few weeks ago when I was deciding um, how I would move forward in how I speak and communicate. I first decided to throw out these cards, these, th these cards, these which is nine cards. And so <laughs> I may be all over the place with this. Please bear with me because there is a lot going on. And honestly, when I woke up this morning, I knew that there was something that was going to go down that I had not planned, but I did not like gain the excitement and the amazement until in a very short amount of time, I, I almost obsessively just pulled notes together and it was like, yes, now talk about this. Even, I mean, so much so that I pulled notes from 2013. Now, as, as I've mentioned before, I have a habit, whether it's books or notes or journal entries, whatever it is, I will um, date and time stamp it because for one, I sift through a lot of content. And for two, being in this this weird space of years after my head on collision and needing to keep my frontal lobe exercised for the threat of early dementia, I just needed to make sure that I could keep track of what was going on when. So when I'm able to pull up on something that I uh, took note of that long ago, it, it, it does something to me. One of the things that it does to me is confirm that all that I have been handling and researching was not in vain. So let's go over the cards. So, as I've said, it's nine cards. So, and, and the way I had it, okay, I think I already said that. So, it's clockwise, right? So, at the, at the top of the clock, at the 12 o'clock hour, is the death card. And I decided to put in notation, in my notes, when I wrote down the situation of the layout, because it was just so unique to me, I made it the high noon. I made it uh, the 12 o'clock, the high noon mark. And then the second card is the two of swords, 
third card is the lovers. The fifth card, uh, fourth card is the five of swords. Fifth card is the ten of swords, which is situated at the bottom of the hour. The sixth card is the three of cups. Interesting. The seventh card is the king of pentacles. The eighth card is the ace of swords. And the ninth card in the center of the spread is justice. With the Ten of Swords being at the bottom of the hour, lets me know that we are, um, whether you want to look at it individually or collectively, we are in the midst of major paradigm shifts. And I honestly don't have to say that to you. I believe that anyone who finds themselves in front of this video or in front of this session in the midst of this moment knows this without me saying it there are things that are unfolding in your life that already suffice as supporting evidence to what i say to be true looking at the spread the way that it is not only does it indicate to me that the tipping of the hourglass is going to remove the swords out of our backs it also tells me that we are not to get rid of the swords. We are not to disregard the swords, ignore the swords, not be afraid of the swords. To me right now, the way that it looks is that the swords serve as lessons and information and things that we could actually transmute into power if utilized properly. I'm going to officially open up this session by saying, which I think I may uh, make this the stand-in opening for my uh, sessions that I post in the public domain movement. I, I'm going to, I, I, blah, 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 blah. <laughs> I believe I am going to be utilizing this moving forward. <laughs> Something tells me this is going to be an incredible ride. <laughs> Buckle up. <laughs> With this said, allow me to disclose that I do not produce any of my sessions for entertainment. Class is officially now in session. Please have your notebooks and your highlighters and your pencils, your flashcards, your tarot cards, your guidebooks. Have them readily available so that our time together may absorb in its destined nature. So, <laughs> I'm going to... lead with a journal entry that I logged in on Tuesday, June 9th at 8.30 a.m. It may be a bit of the journal entry from Wednesday, June 10th. So June 9th, 2020 at 8.30 a.m. I am tussling with all sorts of thoughts and feelings. With wondering or with wondering and or discovering why do any good? Because knowing better doesn't always mean doing better. I try not to lose sight of my birth chart and the details that point out indicators of prolonged phases of challenges, plus my extraordinary elements of individuation regarding to my Saturn and Gemini zero degrees in retrograde, my Pluto and Libra two degrees in retrograde, my Mars and Aries six degrees, 
and my black moon Lilith in Libra, 24 degrees. I am still studying these details, but the way life has been unfolding, yet slowly but surely manifesting, I can sense the truity of this combination. And this isn't even half of the elements of my entire chart. I often wonder if this, I often wonder, hang on. I often wonder if this part of my core curriculum, hang on, <laughs> I might have been speeding, but I think I, I know what I want to, I often wonder if this part of my core curriculum was presented during grade school, would I be approaching how would I be approaching right now? Okay, got it. So, so, <laughs> what what's even more intriguing is how this is so what's even more intriguing is how this is so in various private schooling. It's been set up this way for centuries. Those that have been pegged to rule the world fluently speak the language, the languages of tarot, mysticism, philology, philosophy, mythology, depth psychology, astrology, astronomy, and cartomancy for divination purposes, as well as the clarity within the unknown none of which is even mentioned in public schooling. Public schooling programming is meant to produce workers and laborers. Private school programming is to groom creators, innovators, directors, and executives. The sponge likeness of every mind of human beings can absorb any style of content and or context and or context that it's presented with. And even with some having stronger attractions to some content slash context over others, the offering and accepting to explore, examine, and expand is still suitable to all. So who determines who's learning, exploring, examining, expanding, what, when, where, how, and why? And then moving on to Wednesday, June 10th. And this, I wrote this at, at high noon at 12 p.m. It's been 294 days since I began the journey to manifest my freshman manuscript. Much has transpired. So plenty of hours of research has been logged in. I sense I am nearly close to completion and yet I willingly venture down a rabbit hole into a honeycomb of content I've never encountered before. And so I'm going to end it there um, because I'm still pondering all that I discovered while I was in that rabbit hole. Not quite ready to talk about that just yet. But what I will say is that the examination of the number 13 arose inside of that rabbit hole experience. And I was on the phone with my older son yesterday and I told Maverick that, and we speak about this often, but it, 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 it was quite intriguing the way that it came up in that, in, in, in the latest conversation. And we have to distinguish which parts of the narrative applies to us by whom is the narrator, who is telling the story. Because as I often say, one man's God is another man's devil. One man's trash is another man's treasure. We, 
honestly cannot go on believing that the perspective of the dominant narrative belongs to each and every one of us. And also inside that rabbit hole experience, I began to be introduced to the, to the, the uh, more uh, fundamental details of the individuation process by Carl Gustav Jung. And in a previous recording, I made the distinction between me ascribing to being a young Yuan with me leaning more towards young Yuan psychology than Freudian psychology, just based on the fact of imagery, imagination, sensory, um, emotionality, more of the right brain hemisphere psychology. And so we, when I say we, I mean those that have been groomed and raised and conditioned on American soil. We've had this thing with the 13th and mainly Friday the 13th. And a few years ago, I had made the declaration that I was going to cease being spooked by this thing that is prominently considered evil especially surrounding Satan and the devil. It's amazing how when you tap into who's telling the story, it comes alive of who they would call this, that, and a third. And I often relate it to myself. When I analyze or observe other people's opinions of me, According to some, <laughs> I am Satan's spawn. According to some. And then there are others, very few though, that know my heart, that have spent countless hours with my tender parts and would beg to differ. Sometimes I giggle about what it would look like inside of a room with those that would share, honestly, authentically share how they feel about me or the impressions that I've left upon them. And what I know for a fact is that there would be a myriad of impressions and opinions and judgments permeating that space. And yet I sit in the core of all of that because the complexity of this thing is that all depending on the alignment of the stars, the moons, <laughs> the sun, yeah, the, the galactic belts, like all of it, the orbiting of physical spaces and non-physical spaces, like the slightest shift will make all of them true and all of them false we have to well you don't have to let me say me I have to remain aware of the flip side capacity and availability of this realm we are conduits of light and dark And so I can't say it enough. I can't say it enough to keep us aware of inside the same person will be instances where they are glory. And I mean graciously glory. And maybe in the next turn of energy, they are gloom and doom. And their behaviors will depict that. I truly believe that that's all part of the package of the human experience. That none of us are going to leave this realm not having experienced a balance of both the feel good and the not so feel good to the damn near traumatic all the way 
across the spectrum to the triumphs with all sorts of trials and errors mixed and mingled in between. You're not getting out of this joint unscathed. Even the privileged have their intentions of incident and, and insecurity and yeah. <laughs> So, I'm going to read to you, which can be easily researched online, what I found acceptable with regards to the number 13. Today is June 13. I've begun to incorporate a lot more numerology knowledge into my space to sharpen my awareness around the, the synchronicities of numbers as it shows up as my clues or my cues. So the number 13 represents the combination, mm -mm, sorry, the number 13 represents the combined energy of the numbers one and three. It is a number with very strong symbolism and has great power. Number one has a vibration of new ideas, new beginnings, progress, and individuality. And the number three symbolized passion, motivation, optimism, self-expression, inspiration. Now, as I mentioned in my journal entry, my Chiron and Aries is all about my journey into my individuality, unapologetically embracing that which is me, all of it, the good, the bad, and the urban ugly. So I want to take you back for a moment, if you're journey with me. I was on the brink of age eight, and some major things went down when I was age six that sent me into a habitual hermit mode. Now for the sake of not wanting to rehash the horrid moments of, of that space at age six, just know that it was traumatic enough for even at age six, or, 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 or should I say prior to the, those strings of incidents, older family members would tell me that I was this talkative, bubbly child that used words that I couldn't spell. And that I was always surprising them with the words I would use to the point where they would take note of it. And then this string of fuckery happened and I went in. I stopped speaking freely. That happened at age six. So age seven, interestingly enough, I don't remember. I don't remember my life at age seven at all. And I've tried to pull it up. I've been in several therapy sessions to try to pull it up. And I can't, for the sake of anything, pull it up. It also strikes me odd that my life path number through official calculations is the number seven, which um, conventionally means the seeker. Now I'm still trying to gain clarity around that, but let's jump to age eight. For some reason, unbeknownst to me, because remember, I'm still at an age where adults completely control my destiny and the, manifest, the manifestations of my day-to-day. -day. So I didn't have the type of inner circle that would sit with me and gather how, how I felt about something. They didn't put me on point about what was getting ready to happen to me, why it was happening to me. Most of the conversations about me were without me. 
So before I knew it, I was on a Delta flight to Louisiana, which would end up being two years with my dad's dad's sister. And believe it or not, I remember quite a bit about those years. And not only not only did it strike me odd that I would have to be fly, I, <laughs> I arrived in Louisiana alone. I flew first flight ever without any family member. Nobody on that flight was familiar to me. Now, I have to say, I'm not sure how it is now, but back then, Delta and American Airlines were very adamant about the love and compassion and the just the all-around care that their flight attendants provided. And I think I might have said this before, where that, even though it was as traumatic as it was in my hindsight, it still had its silver linings in and out of it, weaved in and out of the fabric of the situation. Because of that type of handling, that that type of chaperonic handling, is that even a word? I don't know, but we going yeah, it fits now. We're gonna, we gonna fit it in there. <laughs> it moved me and even though I did not pursue a career as a flight ten attendant, from that tender age until just beyond high school graduation, that was what I was set to do in my mind. That was that was the that was the direction that I was moving in. Now it moved me just beyond graduation because I actually did go and did a full completed course to become certified as a travel agent and worked that for about four or five years before I ventured into my career as a uh, certified hairstylist. But all of that <laughs> to say that my association with flights and my association with Louisiana for a very long time was so heavy and weighty that I was frightened to even step foot in Louisiana. It was something that was embedded so unconsciously that even when the term Louisiana would come up, it would jolt my heart. It would do something weird where I would instantly shut it out. I didn't even want to think about Louisiana. And that's not to say that my time there, anyone done anything harsh to me. I was just in familiar, unfamiliar territory with unfamiliar people. People I've never, had never even, I didn't even know they existed. It didn't even truly latch on to me that I was with family until I was older inside of therapy sessions, hashing some of this shit out. But in hindsight, it took me, not even in just in hindsight, but with a lot of self-reflection and a lot of uh, emotional reconciliation did I have to walk back in time and gather the truity of it all. Because a lot of it was bound in the stories that I was telling myself out of frustration and judgment, out of the story of how is it that my family will send me on a flight? I'm eight years old by myself. And why did I have to spend damn near 24, 25, 26 months in what I considered for a long time foreign territory? Like, why did nobody come for me? Like, who am I for real? What does this mean? And then I walk into 
the flavors of mysticism. And I began to tap into the details of my birth chart. And then I began to mix and mingle that with the knowledge of the individuation process. And then I get to dive a little deeper and understand that my Chiron and Aries has everything to do with my true self-expression and my ability to love me wholly. So then, what makes sense to me with regards to the spread? At high noon, at the top of the hourglass is death. Inside the language of tarot, it is not associated with, with the mainstream concept of physical death. It's all about transformation. It's all about energetic vibration. It's all about paradigm shifting, paradigm contouring paradigm reconstruction redesigning we are back at the drawing board high noon we are back at the drawing board so let me read for you out of the guidebook in association to the death card If I can find it. <laughs> really? Where? Hold on. And I should know the... Excuse me. Okay. I should know the... I'm losing my words. Let's just read. <laughs> and I am reading from the Paulina Tarot um, guidebook. Guide the, death, the death card. The watchful phoenix of immortality finds comfort in, expand, in experiencing death as transformation. The tree appears dead, yet it is undergoing metamorphosis and renewal of life. From the heart of the tree comes three beings that rest between states. A winged cat symbolizes a winged cat symbolizes the mystery and rebirth that death brings. And so the at a glance meanings of death is transformation, end of a cycle, crossing into a new phase of life, elimination of old patterns, release, extreme change this rings true for me as I continue to get in the habit of reobserving my past reanalyzing my present Recontemplating my future. Because at the end of the day, as I've mentioned in the Big Mama series, we are well equipped to shift paradigms, rewrite stories, get records straight. Finally and forever. But we must pick up the confirmation, or not even a confirmation, we must pick up the willingness to sit with and sift through. If we're going to constantly run from it, or willfully ignore it, it will never shape shift. It will never transform, transmute. It needs our time, focus, and energy applied to it in order for it to transform. And without a doubt, the old is dying. 
and all sorts of innovation and new paradigms are emerging. With that said, we're going to go into the next card, which is the Two of Swords. The woman concentrates as she weighs her options. Her blindfolded and yellow skirt indicate her fear of seeing the truth. Watchful figures urge her to make a wise decision in order to move forward. The meaning for the two of swords at a glance is avoiding the truth, indecision, fear of the unknown, clouded judgment. As I associate this with my personal journey into my emotional evolution and my own unique individuation process, Having the courage to sit with my memories of Louisiana to the point where the thought of just being, and Louisiana is a big state. Now, I was uh, directly situated inside of Shreveport, but remember, just the energy of Louisiana is so, it runs so deep, historically, Figuratively and literally, energetically, spiritually, there's a lot that permeates inside the ley lines of Louisiana. But only by me taking up the willingness to sit with that which haunted me was I able to transmute it into a different life. Now, I am glorified in it. Why? Because not only do I have true, sincere roots in Louisiana, it makes a lot more sense of how and why I would be attracted to what I am attracted to, especially with regards to intellectual value. It's not by mistake that I was being primed for these attractions that would give me cause to investigate further, to examine more, to explore and unpack on a more legacy lineage nature, giving me the fundamental pride to figure this shit out. And even more so, as I found myself being moved by the story of Marie Laveau on many levels. Now, what I'll say first and foremost is that our connection and name, my middle name is Marie and getting down to the bare bones of what that means Marie equates to the queen of sorrow. So without being spooked out, I can automatically translate my destiny to the shadow side, my ability to translate and be a tour guide inside the dark spaces that many folk do not want to venture into. And most often will completely shut it off. Me knowing what that looks like, feels like, smells like, I get it. But without me stepping into the willingness to explore inside of the realms of mysticism, to understand tarot as a love language, to be able to dive deep into the details of my birth chart, it would have never come to me the significance of me facing this. So let's move on to the next card, the lovers.
tiny spirits circle the lovers. But where will but where will they lead the pair? Trust and teamwork keep the lovers in balance as they allow someone else to guide the bird. The woman wears a gown of passionate red and warm yellow. Her parasol offers protection from the heart. I'm sorry, offers protection from the heat of desire. The at a glance meaning for the lovers is honesty, trust, communication, making important relationships, choices, partners, and trusting instincts. I'm learning more and more that the lovers has a literal as well as a figurative meaning and that it speaks inside of physical and non-physical spaces and that the energy itself could be an indication of a sacred union outside of oneself as well as it could mean a sacred union within oneself. In context to what we are speaking right now, in alliance with the theme, the tipping of the hourglass, I honestly believe that it showed up to give indication about all of the chemistry and compatibility within oneself as one sits with oneself, contemplate for oneself, by oneself. That's not to say that the opinions of others are worthy and valuable, invaluable even, but it does mean that the intellectual seeds and the emotional seeds must be planted by self. The relationship with self is most important. So the next card is the Five of Swords. A disillusioned young man contemplates the veins, I'm sorry, contemplates the vines in place of his hands, forcing him to accept his limitations. He must find the courage to walk between the two swords to, to discover a better pathway. So now we are tapping into the invitations the silent, non-physical invitations to step into that which I like to call a purpose discovery portal, which is to me a pocket of energy full of discovery regarding self and what it came into this realm for and why. Each and every time I sit and visit with the details of my birth chart, I'm inside of a purpose discovery pocket, which I willfully cross into. I am aware and acknowledge that I am stepping into a time loop for the full glory of my discovery surrounding my purpose. This card showing up allows me to say without fault or failure that there is energies, there are purpose discovery portals at our I wanted to say it out back and call, but I don't really think that that's it. They are available. They are available for our utilization, freely available for us to tap into so that we may become equipped with the knowledge around our individuation processes and why we are here in this particular time and space. There is information that awaits you and only you 
which cannot be discovered or delivered by another human being as they ought to be stepping into their own portals. Now, when you return, and you will return, you are to return with the information to share and exchange and engage. It always strikes me odd how we have gotten into the paradigm that says only one leader has the answers versus investing emotionally and intellectually investing in roundtables of all cultures, colors, creeds, criterias. I tell my children all the time, like I honestly see what it is they have to say. I want to see how they view things. I need to hear from them. And I know um, a lot of so-called grown folk don't take that approach. I need to hear from them. They need to become aware of how they are viewing their experiences while they maneuver this jungle of life, especially energetically. There is an entire rubric of non-physical intertwinings that the average human never considers. And I can say that again without fault or failure because of the way life is unfolding. I often imagine what it would be like if every single Human being, especially those with concentrated melanin within their being, actually refer to the non-physical spaces without religious constraint, not no conditioning off of any type of religiosity, just understood that there were beings without being spooked out, not trying to force it through the lens of good and evil, God and the devil, just showing up, suspending judgment, and being able to gather in the clues and cues before them. And I know that might be asking for the damn near impossible because we are intellectually emotionally conditioned to believe this or that. And we are, we are always judging things in opposition, in competition of, versus this and that. Literally, eight people can sit around the table and all be right and wrong in the same fucking sitting. <laughs> And make space for that. And be able to pull and patch that which works. And be able to identify and, ele and, and eliminate that which don't. And because it works today does not mean it's going to work tomorrow. And that we stand in free reign to be able to ebb and flow this damn thing. which leads us to the bottom of the hour, the Ten of Swords. The Ten of Swords. A bright full moon shines light on the weary girl, bringing new cycles of life. Blue is the color of calm, and the color pink signifies renewed good health. The meaning for the Ten of Swords at a glance is an inevitable ending, merging from emerging from the darkness, a time to recuperate, a sign that the worst is over. The next card is the the Three of Cups. Three women in a Three women in colorful gowns enjoy the company of one another as they toast their friendship. Other beloved friends join their celebration. Each of the women hold an orb of good fortune. 
The at a glance meaning for the three of cup the three of cups is celebration, sharing, team spirit, friendship, unconditional love, something coming into fruition, high spirits, abundance of energy. The next card is the King of Pentacles. The king flies over a garden on an enchanted swan, representing ultimate success. They gracefully fly across the golden sunrise. The added glass meaning for the King of Pentacles is ultimate fulfillment, financial security, a life of luxury, determination, and stability. The next card is the Ace of Swords. The woman victoriously rises to higher levels holding her sword and the fruits of good fortune. The spider beneath her weaves change into her life. The creature beside her, part feline, part bird, has overcome its own obstacles and is stronger for it. The at a glance meaning for Ace of Swords is triumph, justice, victory, honesty, using your intellect, seeing through illusions, resolving a situation, gaining a clear understanding, and doing what is right. And then we move into the last card of the spread, which is in the center, which is in the eye of the clock, also part of the major arcana, and it is the justice card. The sun illuminates justice's authority, clarity, and force. Candles burning in the trees. Hang on a minute, I just have to pick up this card. Interesting, okay. Candles burning in the trees bring situations to light. The dragonflies represent change and the ability to set through and the abilities to see through illusions. The ladybugs at Justice's feet trust her in judgment. The meaning at a glance for justice is balanced through logic, fairness, responsibility, correcting wrongs. And once again, I pause because it feels like no matter how many times over the last couple of days I've laid out these cards in this particular fashion, once I contemplate it, I just pause. And it isn't anything intentional. It's all instinctual. I just pause. We are in the midst of the tipping of the hourglass. We will be in suspended time, all dependent on the conversations that we are holding and who we are holding them with. Before you know it, you will have spent four or five hours engaged in conversations that will enlighten you, inspire you, and shift you into various paradigms. Especially if you have taken up the willingness to sit with yourself, commune with your non-physical influences and entities, as well as bring your full authentic self into the conversation. Those are the ingredients of this thing that I like to call an immaculate conversation. And so now that I'm looking, I didn't even touch <laughs> I didn't even touch all that was gathered for this session so you know what's gonna happen right <laughs> it's gonna turn into a series 
and that was just right here just discovered right here right now um so I'm going to I think I'm going to go over two more things and then I'm going to break it and we're going to um, Yeah, I'm gonna break it and and we're just gonna we yeah we're gonna do breakout sessions. And I, I get the I get the the intuitive feeling that this is gonna turn into a series. And I, I like impromptus. I am finding value in my obedience to tap into the energy in the moment when it tells me to and not put it off or not be hindered due to other things that are the, this that are unfolding that may um, factor in as distractions and so I'm gaining confidence around my awareness to know when it is extraordinary for me to relay what it is that I'm feeling or what's bubbling up for me to exchange and share. With that being said, I created something called Keynotes to Self. And all together it is eight cards and seven are keynotes with the eight card left blank on purpose for whomever is engaging with these cards to write in what comes to mind for their own customizable keynote to sell. But before I get into that, I'm going to share some things that bubbled up this morning um, and late last night. So, Ross Ben, and I think I'm going to, you know what, I don't, I'm not even going to say I think, I'm going to write it down right now so that I will know to attach one of his current sessions that he recently uploaded on his channel, on his YouTube channel. Um, that has stuck with me to the point where it's now in heavy rotation inside of my trains of thought. And I want to share that with you. Inside that session, one of the things that I wrote down that he said, and it was inside of a, it was inside, I believe, a song that he produced. And it said, no room for malice in the palace. And I've been following Rospin, I want to say, for maybe at least a year now, through the tutelage of the Notalage Academy, is what I like to call it. Because it's way more <laughs> than just virtual sharing. Now, on YouTube, the channel is Know the Ledge Media, which is hosted by brothers Red Pill and Blue Pill. And I tapped into them through being part of the spaces with Brother Bobby Hammond and Sister Myra Malls and Brother Rich through the um, Black Magic 363. happened into them over the years and I've been been rocking with brother rich for a while so that's how I came to understand the the pillars and the twins and when they are in scholarship mode <laughs> baby <laughs> yeah they do they thing. <laughs> 
<laughs> and so that you know, just to give six degrees, even really more than six degrees, um, it's 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 a lot more in tune than. And I've been even translating that into six degrees of separation. And even in a real brief communication with Brother Blue Pill, uh, maybe about a year ago, um, he even, you know, enlightened me from that angle saying that because of the virtual spaces, it's, le it's even less than six degrees, more so like one or two. And that is becoming true. And so through Brother Ross Ben, I'm taking the banner to say no room for malice in the palace there is energies of royalty that is kinging and queening and 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 providing space and places for emperors and empresses Dismantling this thing called shame and ceasing from using it as a weapon. The more and more we tap into, especially those that are honestly attracted to understanding this thing called an individuation process. Finding yourself in tune with the details of your own unique birth chart. You will see that there is no right and wrong to this thing. And the more and more you try to shove your perceptions into this untrue polarity, the more and more you're going to find yourself frustrated with the way this reality is now permeating, unfolding, turning, contouring. Because the world going to turn. And folks and places and things and ideas and concepts and contexts, they're going to ebb and flow like the waves and ripples of the ocean. And that just like the pebbles of the beach, you're not going to be able to hold on to the wetness. There are going to be some days when you're going to be saturated, some days when you're going to be dry as a bone. Some days when you're going to be saturated, some days you might be overloaded, some days you might be flooded, some days you might be in drought. You are not going to be able to hold on to this thing called routine and planning and expectation and prediction. Long term, let me say that. I think that the flexibility to grab it in the moment is really what's going to become the hot commodity of this time and space, this epoch uh, of enlightened evolution. And we're going to get away from shaming folk that does not speak like us, feel like us, look like us, rock like us, rhythm like us. It's all... I bring potato salad, you bring macaroni and cheese, they bring barbecue chicken, you know, like that's what the cookout is all about. I honestly don't want to sit at no table where everybody bought macaroni and cheese. That shit going to clog me up. <laughs> Somebody bring fresh veggies and fruits and, and kernel from the garden, you know, like there is a cornucopia of things to feed from, literally and figuratively. So here are the seven keynotes to self. And I like to call it the intra to the second power enrichment. Intra meaning within. So to the second power, these seven cards may bring immaculate enrichment, enrichment, hoping to serve as your key factors to how you contribute while in conversation.
And so here's a quote for keynote number one. The railroad tracks were built long before there was a train to make the trip. The insights, due diligence, and perseverance of its architects deemed all things possible. And this is actually true when you look back on the evolution of the railroad system. They had not built the train that was going to travel a lot of tracks that crisscrossed this grand landscape called America. But they knew that it would. And so the tracks to make the trip is what came first before they ever had an apparatus to travel it. So adjacent to keynote number one is amongst the greatest gift you will ever bestow upon yourself or others is your undivided attention and true engagement. So note to self number two, your mind is a garden. Your thoughts are seeds. You can grow flowers or you can grow weeds. <laughs> I like that. I always like that one. I have to keep myself reminded about that one. <laughs> Keynote to self number three. The emotionally invested time spent re refining one's mental processes and cultivating one's intellectual gardens can be simply graciously achieved through successive unfoldings of research and development and the crafting of one's own storyline. The art of telling one's own story improves cognitive agility a thousandfold. Simply put, to sit with it, to not run from it, to not suppress it, to give it its emotional just due, to honestly feel feel about it the way you feel about it and then take that and transmute it into a balance of a balance through your light lit your lightness lens and your shadow lens stand in the middle of those two and ebb and flow you are allowed to feel the way you feel about the things that have unfolded in your life as they have, with whom they have. If you're not mad about it, don't be mad about it. If you are mad about it, be mad about it. But then lovingly sit with yourself to hone into the reasons why. By doing so, you can graciously achieve Keynote to self number four. <laughs> Give a human a fish and she or he will eat for a day. Coach by story. The instructions to fish as she and he, she or he shall eat for a lifetime. Keynote to self number five. Never ever judge yourself or others with haste. Many elements are working in progress. Perfect timing of seasons and cycles, bloom and blossom, an array of plants and flowers. And in the proverbial words of Treebeard from the trilogy, The Hobbit, haste makes waste. Keynote to self number six. The best teachers, coaches, tutors are those that show you where to look, but not what to see. We all look through different lenses. Keynote to self number seven, serenity and serendipity. Granting me the acceptance of synchronicity 
and the understandings that there's plenty I am not to change or challenge, as well as embracing the courage to explore and exhibit the plenty that I am to change and challenge, alongside the endowing wisdom to decipher the difference. And keynote to self number eight is left blank for your dynamo edifice to be able to freely capture that which is unfolding specifically for you. And what makes it so interesting is that the concept around the number eight, the infinity symbolization of the number eight is that it's almost like a blank check. So you really don't even have to leave it to just one note, one keynote to self. It's left blank as a canvas. So many, much, plenty can be encompassed in the blank canvas. And so that concludes what feels like part one. And, um, I'm sure as my next couple of days unfold for me that it'll become clear if this is going to be a multifaceted series, how many, you know, now, like I said, now, now that is literally presented as this was going down, that this, this is pretty much going to be a series. Um, and so I will, I will tap into my time to refer to the mound of information that I had not had a chance to get to in this segment and see if I can map out how the next segment is going to unfold. So until next time, thanks for joining me and I wish you well.